Today is the Sunday after the Epiphany, and the Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which would become his hometown for the rest of his life which Capernaum is by the Sea of Gennesaret in the, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. These are two tribes uh, of Israel. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. The light of the world has come to his own, as we said a few days ago, and Christ began to preach after St. John was arrested. And interestingly enough, in his first sentences of preaching, he repeated the words, of Saint John the Baptizer. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, it's quite interesting that Christ, at the very beginning of his ministry, he did not try to make some great miracle to resurrect a dead person. He began to speak about repentance. And the reason for that is because Christ came to complete what Adam and Eve could not complete in paradise. That's why Christ is the new Adam. Adam and Eve did not repent in paradise, and because of their lack of repentance, we inherited the propensity towards sin, and now the new Adam comes to restore and correct and renew what Adam and Eve were not able to complete. Unfortunately, they could have repented in paradise, but they failed to do so. When God the Logos asked uh, Adam, Adam, where are you? This was a hint. Tell me, where, what kind of spiritual state are you at right now? What happened to you? But Adam was not getting it. He blamed Eve, the woman that you gave me, and then Eve did the same thing. She blamed the snake, and obviously, if you, God, if you, Lord, had not created the snake, then we would have been fine. So this lack of repentance caused them to be guided outside of paradise, where they knew each other. And to, to answer someone's question that I was not able to answer completely the other day, why did Christ did not need to be married? Simply because marriage is something that took place after the fall. There is no marriage in the kingdom of God. There was no marriage in paradise. Adam and Eve were at the state of illumination and their thoughts were totally connected with God. There were no carnal thoughts whatsoever. So Christ is the new Adam. And as we said, he took the nature of Adam before the fall. So he took our nature and he washed it in the Jordan River because the nature of the Panagia had the ancestral sin. However, when the Holy Spirit hovered over the Panagia, totally cleansed her from the ancestral sin. When uh, God the Logos took her nature, this nature was already cleansed and it was the same as the nature of Adam before the fall. Now lately you heard the term the Great Reset and people speak about a reset in the financial arena, how the whole banking system is going to be reset and we're going to be going towards a cashless society and uh, I think we had enough of those videos. So I think it's time to get back to basics, to get back to studying the scriptures, studying the Psalms, listening to the Psalms. I think we have enough 
information about vaccines and resets and all these 5Gs and all these different things that we have been bombarded with during 2020. I believe in the beginning of this new year, it is good to get back to the basics. But there is a great reset, a spiritual, a noetic reset, the kind of reset that Christ told us about 2,000 years ago when he was telling Luke and Cleopa on their way to Emmaus, you're not using your noose. You need to reset your noose and begin to understand the scriptures. The great reset in orthodoxy is when the mind, when the noose begins to tune into the life of God. When the noose, when the mind begins to align itself with the mindset of God. This is what we call repentance, which is a word that a lot of the translations don't want to use anymore. Instead of saying repent, some of your English translations will say amend your ways change your ways but that's not that's not repentance so if you change your things in your life you're not necessarily repenting repentance is not to cut a few of our passions it's a good start but if you have a boat and a boat has five holes in it if you only plug one or two the boat is still going to sink so it's not enough just to cut one or two of our bad passions repentance is the total reorientation of our mindset the total reset to begin to walk towards the life of God, to become Christ-like and God-like. To help us with the path to repentance, we will have St. John the Chrysostom tell us about five different methods, five different methods of coming to a fruitful repentance. And one of these methods, one of these paths that can lead to fruitful repentance according to St. John the Chrysostom is the acknowledgement of our sins and the condemnation of ourselves. Very obvious to us in all the prayers of the saints, the prayers before Holy Communion, we can see in there how they look at themselves because they don't compare themselves to those in uh, jail cells, but they compare themselves to Christ. So self-accusation is a great way to begin to have aphtognosia or self-knowledge. Saint Simeon, the new theologian, speaks about this in one of his great prayers where he says, Ida sote oti alus osemeu keptesesi, I know my Savior that no one has offended you more than I and no other person did such deeds as I have committed. But I also know that no number of sins can exhaust your forbearance. And this is exactly what we do when we go to Holy Confession. We accuse ourselves and we say, Father, I have sinned. I have these weaknesses and I don't know why, but it happens. I need to improve myself. I have this part of my life that I need to change. And over there, I did that thing wrong. I'm going to try to improve myself by the grace of God always. And this is the kind of mindset we read about in the psalm of repentance psalm 51 a sacrifice to god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart god will not despise because god would rather have a sinful person beat his chest and say lord I am a sinner, I'm very sinful, forgive me, and have contrition, like the tax collector, than to have a quote-unquote sinless Pharisee who thinks he's so perfect that God has no one better than him in this world. A second great path of repentance is to forgive very quickly. A person who constantly repents and accuses themselves will have no problem forgiving the other person because he sees himself as a great sinner. So if I'm always sinning, 
then why shouldn't my brother be allowed to sin as well? Just like God forgives me and I'm constantly sinning, God will also forgive my brother. So a great path to repentance is to forgive very quickly, even our enemies. And we repeat this every day in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I don't need to remind you the example of Saint Dionysius of Zakynthos, who was a hermit. He lived outside of the city and some uh, fugitive came by and he needed his help. And the saint asked him to confess. So while he's confessing, the fugitive revealed to the saint that I just killed someone and I'm running from the police. When he asked my son, who was the person that you killed? The fugitive told him, and unfortunately it happened to be the saint's sibling, his brother. The saint read him a prayer of absolution. He gave him supplies and he helped him. And he even told the police that, no, I never seen such person. He broke the human law to protect this fugitive. What a great example of loving kindness. Another proven method of repentance is persistence in prayer. You know, whenever we fall and we despair and we say, how could I do such a thing? How can I possibly do such a thing? This kind of attitude shows quite a bit of egotism. A spiritual person would tell Christ, if it wasn't for your grace, I would have done a lot worse. Thank you for helping me because I am capable of doing much worse things. So persistence in prayer and humility will help us to continue our journey towards repentance. Whenever we have a fall, if we begin to despair and say, well, I can't do this anymore. You know, I, I'm not strong enough. I can't do this. And we walk away from the gospel. We don't have repentance. Whenever we fall, we run to our prayer room and we strengthen our prayer. This is proof that our repentance is legitimate. We have the example of the widow and the unjust judge in the 18th chapter of Luke. This widow was approaching this unjust judge who was not afraid of God and certainly didn't care much for people. He's doing an injustice to me and you're supposed to to, to bring this person to justice. The judge was just ignoring her. But this woman was going there daily and just constantly reminding him. And this judge says, you know what? I'm not afraid of God. I don't care about people. But this woman is getting on my nerves. She's going to worm me out if I don't give her justice. And the Lord uses this example to show us that if an unjust judge gives this woman what she wanted, then how would our Father in heaven not give us what is of interest to us if we continue to ask him about the things that would help our soul and not, not necessarily the things that would help us here on earth. Sometimes people think that God doesn't answer our prayers. He always answers our prayers. But sometimes what we ask is not to our best interest. An interesting thing that I just saw in this chapter, after Jesus finishes with this specific parable, he asks in verse 8, he says, I tell you that he will avenge, the judge will avenge them speedily, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And then out of context, and I, really, I need to study this because I know about this verse very well because I use it all the time, but I don't see the connection between the judge and this, this prayerful woman and what Christ says next. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This would be an interesting study to see what is the connection between this prayerful woman and finding faith on earth when Christ comes back. A fourth path to repentance, according to St. John the Chrysostom, is almsgiving and having a merciful heart. 
to be merciful because our Father in heaven is merciful. When we have a loving heart, even though we may not be on the true path, we may still be lacking in some areas. And I'm gonna give you the example of Cornelius in the Acts of the Apostles, I believe chapter 10. Cornelius, he was an idolater. He was not a Jew, he was a Roman centurion. But he was praying and fasting for days at a time. He says, I was praying and fasting for three days when St. Peter got the message from an angel to go meet this Cornelius. It was the almsgiving and this loving heart of Cornelius that pulled the Holy Spirit to come and take Peter to go and baptize him with his entire family. We also have another wonderful example of two great saints that we just commemorated a few weeks ago, Bonifatios, Boniface, and uh, Aglaia. They were not married. The one actually was the servant, he was her servant, and they had some kind of a romantic relationship. And unfortunately, although they were both baptized Christians, they were not able to keep the commandment that says, do not commit adultery or fornication. But at the same time, they were constantly asking for forgiveness and asking for God to give them the strength to overcome this passion. But one of the details in their life story is that they were extremely merciful. They were constantly giving alms. They had a loving heart. Because of their loving heart, God led Boniface to martyrdom and brought Aglaia back to great repentance and uh, she reached her potential in becoming Christ-like as well. And the last and final method of repentance, according to St. John Chrysostom, is when we develop a very humble mindset, to have humble mindedness and to constantly tell ourselves that if we are even walking in the path of Christ, it doesn't come from us, everything comes from God. Once again, the humble mindset of the tax collector a very sinful person who lived in a very sinful lifestyle, this humble and contrite spirit opens heaven. Saint Peter of Damascus says, no matter how sinful we are, we must not despair. Despair and despondency are the worst enemies of repentance. Even if we cannot eliminate some of our weaknesses or passions and we continue to fall, if we are constantly asking God's assistance in this matter, and we feel contrition for our failure and our offense to God, we will eventually be given the strength to enter the life of God. And the way we do this is by developing a spirit of self-accusation and humility, which St. Anthony found out when he visited the shoemaker in Alexandria, when St. Anthony had the thought, Lord, is there anybody around that I can go and benefit from? Is there anybody at my spiritual height? And an angel of, of the Lord told him, yes, there's someone in uh, Alexandria, he's a shoemaker. Anthony was surprised. He went to Alexandria and uh, he began to interview this man. And what, what is your lifestyle? How, how do you live on a daily basis? And says, well, I give a third to the poor. I give one third to the church and the other third I, I use it of my income. I use it to, to live for my needs and my wife. No, no, I, many people do this. What else do you do? After enough insistence from St. Anthony, this great man of God said, I constantly pray this prayer. Lord, everyone is being saved. I am the only one that will be lost. Everyone is being saved. I am the only sinner that will end up in Hades. Because he saw nothing good in his works. And this is a great characteristic of our saints. If you ask any of our saints about any kind of good works they have done, they will tell you, I have nothing good, I have nothing. I am going to Christ with empty hands. And if you ask a very ignorant person who doesn't think he needs to go to confession, he'll tell you exactly the opposite. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a good person. I don't need to confess. 
my brothers and sisters in Christ, Happy New Year. And I repeat once again that I think it's about time for all of us, and I am the first, to get back to the basics, the studying of the scriptures, reading and listening to the Psalms, and continuing on our path to repentance, because without repentance, no one will see God. Amen.